pastor or preacher, I was a Bible teacher. And what I do with the youth on Wednesday nights and when I do lessons for them is I prepare sheets that have scriptures, that has notes. And as I was studying last week, getting ready for today, the Lord told me to do that for you. So if you don't want it and you're not interested, you're not a note person, please don't worry about it. Don't feel any pressure. But I was just simply being obedient to the Holy Spirit because I believe that all of us should continuously be Bible students. That when we hear the word, it's not just coming to church and getting the word and going home. It is being able to chew on that on Tuesday and Wednesday, to go back to those scriptures, to go back to those notes, and for it to continue to transform your mind, to do a surgery on your heart long after you've heard it. You chew on it for a little bit, and then when you're back for Sunday, your, your appetite is set again. So those notes are coming. And um, my husband actually calls me a preach teacher. <laughs> I have, um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Keisha Spidey. I have the honor of being the youth pastor here. So for those of you who are visiting family for the 4th of July, we welcome you to Church on the Rise. Pastor Richard will be here on next Sunday, and we'll be doing our series. We have a lot of fun in the month of July, so he's going to be kicking up with that on, on next week. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I do have a PowerPoint. We're going to be coming from Philippians 3. Originally, I said verse 10, but we're going to um, move back up to verse verse 10. Um, we start at 12. We're going to start at verse 10. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you right now for this time. I declare for just, just we thank you for that time of praise and worship to where we could check everything else that was trying to occupy space in our mind and we could get centered on you. That we could hear from you, that we could receive from you, God, and that our hearts would be prepared for the word that you wanted to plant into each and every one of us, God. So we're declaring that we are alert, that we are attentive, and that as you're speaking to us, the seed is being sown, God, and we're believing that a harvest is going to come forth in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, after I'm going to start reading, I believe the verses are going to be up on the screen for you. And we're going to get right into this text. And it's a lot of meat. A lot of nuggets and a lot for us to chew on, which is one of the reasons why I wanted you to kind of have the note pages so you don't get caught up in trying to write it down, that you have it to kind of follow along with you for, throughout the week. So, verse 10 starts out with, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, now that I have already obtained this and am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have obtained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Now, I read through all of those scriptures because I wanted you to get a full picture of what was going on here. Earlier in chapter 3, before we get to the text, we have Paul encouraging his audience to first rejoice in the Lord. Then he tells them to watch out for people that are preaching something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then he tells them to compare everything a loss compared to knowing Christ. Here, when we look at this text, Paul is making it very, very clear that we should all have one goal. And that goal is to know Christ and to, to be like Christ. And to be all that Christ had in mind when he designed each and every one of us. Then we get to this text and we are seeing, if you look in your Bible, some of them are subtitled, pressing or straining toward the goal. When we get there, we start talking about being partially perfected. Partially perfected. And when you look at that, I see some hands. I'm excited. Y'all want notes. <laughs> Thank you. I was hoping I wasn't wasting my time when I was putting that together for you. So that blesses me. I see some hands in the back. I told y'all I was a teacher. There we go. Okay. 
Once we get to this and we're talking about this goal, and we're talking about this partially perfected state, we see that this goal is directional. It has one direction. It has one aim, and that is knowing Christ. We also see that it's very intentional because it's single-minded like a trainer. Not only does he have this one goal, he's pursuing that goal like an athlete on purpose and with intention. And when we look at verse 10, we see where Paul is openly stating, wait a minute, I have not figured all this out. Paul opens up in that verse and he's telling us that he has not arrived at this state of perfection. <laughs> None of us have. Look at your neighbor. Look around. Can you work with me? Come on, let's go for July. Look. They're you. not perfect either. <laughs> I don't care how much they try to make you think, they have not arrived. None of us have fully arrived. We're all in the process. But when you look at this perfection, because when you hear that word and people throw it around, let's talk, let's get an understanding of what God says about it. First, he says there's a three stages, and the first one is relationship. It's that perfect relationship. And it has absolutely nothing to do with us. It's just we united with the perfect one. That relationship, we're united with him. Then that second part of it is that perfect progress. This is the part where it's on us because it is our responsibility to grow and to mature spiritually and to continue in our relationship with Christ. Because he's perfect, he's whole, but we're not. So then there's this part where we grow, which is why we come to church, which is why we read our Bible, which is why we do our devotions, which are, which are why we do the things that honor God in our life so that we can grow to become more like him. Then there's that last part. Which is being completely perfect. Which none of us are. Because that does not happen until Christ returns. That does not happen. So when you read further in Philippians 3 verses 20 and 21. It talks a little bit about that. But as we're getting into this text. Paul emphasizes the need for progress in our Christian living. And he's presenting himself as one who's continually moving toward something. He's continually moving toward expanding God's kingdom in and through him. He had this one goal. He had this one goal. And all phases of this perfection that I just shared with you is grounded in our faith in Christ and what he has done. Every bit of it takes its root in what he has done for us. And Paul stresses, if you look at this text, it becomes really personal because he's letting us know he's still involved in the struggles of day-to-day -day life. Paul missed it. He fell short because we live in a fallen world. We, he did. He, did, he was not doing everything at 100%, but he was striving to. He was pressing on so that no matter what happened, God's glory was revealed in and through his life. And Paul encouraged us to press toward this goal with purpose. When you look at verse 13, it says, Paul stated that he was pressing on by forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what would lie ahead of him. Paul had a lot he wanted to forget. If you remember, Paul was the one killing Christians. Paul was the one who held the robes of the people who murdered Stephen. So here he is telling us to forget what was behind. He, he needed to separate himself from Saul. He couldn't move into what God was calling him to do as long as he focused on the life and the choices of Saul. And just like Paul, we've all done things we're ashamed of. Just like Paul, we've all fallen short, yet we can't live there. Our focus has to be moving forward and growing in our knowledge of God by concentrating on that relationship that we have with him right now. You might have missed it yesterday. A few years back, you, what, what are you doing right now to walk and grow with Christ? And just like Paul, we have to realize that God forgives us, but we have to forgive ourselves. And then we have to choose to move on with the life of faith and obedience. When you look at verse 14, it says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is focused on the goal and he's pursuing it as a prize. When you look at the word goal in Greek, it's skapos. And the English root word for that is scope, which translates into a watchman with his eyes fixed on a mark. And that mark for us as Christians has to be the total and complete victory that we have through Christ Jesus. And this message that I'm sharing with you today is not one of a whole lot of laughs and jokes. It is one to make us look into the mirror of our hearts and the mirrors of our minds to see what in our telescope of life do we have in focus. When you start fine-tuning that thing, what image is waiting at what you're scoped at? If as a watchman over your life, what is the mark that you're living and aiming for? What is it that you're pursuing? What is your goal? What's motivating you? 
What are, what's, what, are, what is the framework of the decisions that you make? How you're treating people? Of how you're carrying yourself at work? What is it when you look in through your telescope of faith? What is it that comes into that view? When you think about being fixed on a mark, every one of us in this room has to identify what that mark is for us. And for some of us, it may not be what we thought it should be. Because sometimes in a telescope, things get out of focus. I know y'all are quiet, so I'm assuming that this is digesting. Sometimes, <laughs> as anyone outside of me willing to admit in my life, sometimes things got out of focus. Yes. Thank y'all. Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> Something happens and you get all upset and angry and swollen, and 20 minutes later you realize it doesn't matter. But that thing made you take your scope out of focus. Something happens in your life, the death of a family member, you lose your job, something happens and all of a sudden life has made you take your scope out of focus. What Paul is telling us is, wait a minute, we have to on purpose and with every intention that we have, make sure that we're fine tuning that thing so that the image that shows up in our scope is Christ. And that we're moving toward the prize and the call that he has for us. As I read this verse, I thought to my Facebook page over the last month. Anybody in here on Facebook or social media? <laughs> I know. Jesus, be offense. Help us. <laughs> I thought back to the last month, the last few weeks, and I started getting a little angry. And don't judge me, because the Bible said you can be angry, just don't sin. I, got, I started getting a little bit angry. And I wasn't getting angry at the world, because I expect the world to act worldly. That shouldn't surprise me. I didn't start getting angry at other sinners. Because I expect sinners to do what? Ain't that what you did? And then make up excuses to justify your crazy behavior. Is that, okay, anybody want to be honest? Any, can I get one? Anybody? Thank you in the back. When you were in your stinky, sinful state, somehow or another you justified how that was okay. for this 
destruction. Our spiritual enemy has surrounded us with a smoke screen of poisonous flag distractions to take our minds off the goal. And even in this church today, we got some flag divisions. Even right here. All y'all look so holy. Y'all look so same, same. Y'all look hard. I mean, I'm looking. But even in this place right now, you know, even as a country, we have those we're waving the American flag. It's 4th of July weekend. But you know what? We're waving this flag, and we even got people right now fighting over this because of allegiance. Right? We got people burning and dancing on it, people telling people to leave the country. First of all, this ain't your country. Anyhow, kicking people out, go back. I mean, come on, we've got people, Christians fighting over this. I am proud to be an American. But you know what? That is not where I hold my allegiance first. We got people fighting over this. This one's a big one now. Woo-hoo. Well, yes, I'm in the church house and I'm doing this. This race is not political. This race, this race is 
Hebrew and the Greek and all that other stuff. A mature person is one who figured out they ain't figured it out. <laughs> mature means I don't know. Mature means I have to lean into Jesus. Mature means that I have not arrived. That I have to stay so close to God. I call it every day I need a bloodbath. Every day I need to be reminded of what his word says about me and what he's called me to. Where I have to lean so close to him because I realize left up to my own devices, I'm going to make a mess. My track record has proven that. There should have been a few more amens in here. <laughs> if I'm left to Keisha, somehow another argument, I can figure out how to goof it up. And figure out how to make you think you did it, if I try long enough. Because in and of myself, I am fleshy and so are you. And last time I checked the books, there ain't nothing good up in that. That's what it say. That's what it say. And I know you dress it up. And you try to make it look all holy and dignified. But if you walk around here and you mean, you're giving a false misrepresentation. I'm just saying. We can't do everything the world does. We can't. We're supposed to be different. Pastor Richard, I love when he was speaking a few weeks back and he's talking about being a contrast. We have to be a contrast to the world. And that don't mean that you're sitting in church on Sunday and the world's not. That's not what being a contrast to the world is. It means not watching everything on TV that the world says you're supposed to. Right. It says not listening to all the kind of music that the world's trying to pump into your head. It means separating yourself. It means not living as the world. Being in this world but not of it. So when someone sees you, there should be something blaring different about the way you treat people. About how you respond. We have to be mindful of the images that we are allowing to dictate our telescope. And every day we gotta be, we understand that we're gonna have to fine tune that to get it aligned. When you think about this, you know, everything that we do and say, no matter where we go, has to reflect our love and our commitment to Jesus Christ. There's no exceptions. Everywhere, everything that we allow into our minds, our hearts and our lives, everything that we spend time on and money has to, we have to realize it impacts how we grow or we don't grow spiritually. Everything that we do, mature believers understand that it's our responsibility to monitor what we let into our lives, what we keep out, and how we respond. Because if our ultimate goal is verse 10, knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection, then that has to lead us. That has to lead us. Verse 17 says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Paul had already told us he wasn't perfect. And yet the Bible wasn't being circulated at that time. So he couldn't tell people to read it. So instead, Paul told them, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And I have a question for you. And I want you to think about this a little bit. I actually wrote it on your notes. What kind of follower would a new Christian become if he or she imitated you. Ouch. If they followed you and they imitated you, what type of disciple would they become? Next question. Take a look at your life right now. Who are you currently imitating? <coughs> Who are you imitating? Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's the challenge to us as we pursue the goal God has called us to. Verse 18 says, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, people want to assume that the enemy of the cross, you know, they're the ones, they're ISIS, they're the people. No, the enemy, enemies of the cross are horrible people. People who love and serve the God of this world, and that's God with little g. Those are the enemies of the cross. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, In their case, the God, little g, of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan is the God of this age. And he works to deceive, and he's blinded the minds of people who do not believe in Christ, and he tries to lure away the ones that do. Money, power, pleasure, flesh, 
instant gratification. He uses those lures to bait them. And literally, they're being drawn and pulled away from who and what they say they believe. Those who reject Christ and prefer their own pursuits have unknowingly made Satan their God. Think about that for a minute. Those who reject Christ and prefer their own pursuits, lifestyles of sin, when you put in whatever that sin is, have unknowingly made Satan their God. Verse 19 says, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory and their shame with minds set on earthly things. Those in the world are consumed with temporary pleasure and sinful desires are controlling them. My husband said it best a couple weeks ago and all this stuff started happening and people were doing all this hate stuff with the gay marriage. And Eric, who's so calm all the time, nothing ruffles his feelings ever. I try it all on a regular basis and it just doesn't happen. And he says, you know, why, why are y'all why are people fighting over that? Do they not know the end? Read the book. Why, why are you gonna argue? Why are people arguing over that? Then he gave me, he's a historian like politics, and then he began to tell me about the government and all that stuff. I started checking out. But he was talking about the, the role of the government and, and it was all good stuff, I'm sure. But at that moment I was not from the ministry lesson. But he basically said, why there's why don't we be about what we're supposed to be doing and let's let the Holy Ghost take care of them. Don't be surprised by what the world is doing. Quit being, oh, the Bible says if you read the Bible, this is just the start. Don't be surprised. Don't let them move your telescope. As believers, it's our job to reach them, to share the gospel with them, lead them to hope that's only found in a personal relationship with Jesus. I realized God was tempering my heart when every time I started seeing the rainbows on, showing up on everything, my heart started grieved, grieved, being grieved. So I'm like, they don't know my God. They don't know my God. They may say, especially the Christian people, they, they're calling themselves Christians, but they're really just chins because they got the chin. They want the family without the Christ. They're Christians and then they're chins. Christians understand God is the model. And even if you don't agree with what he says, truth reigns. You submit. I don't always agree with my husband. A lot of times I don't always agree with my husband. But I love him. And I understand authority. So what do I do? I shut my mouth. Because I understand the power of authority. And my blessings are directly linked to me being in proper alignment with him. Yes, I got the mouth. He got the brains. It worked. <laughs> and he don't need recognition. He don't need a mic. So he teaches me and I come tell y'all. So it works. <laughs> so when I understand that alignment, I can walk and live a blessed life. And even in this world, with everything going and going like it's supposed to, when I submit to the authority that I have in God and I do as God instructs me to do, all that can be going on around me, but not the song. alignment. We're not to be hateful and nasty because of the lifestyle choices. We can't because sin is sin. We got to offer a contrast. Your Facebook page should never have any comments that point people away from Christ. I don't care if you think you're right. Every right green on view ain't righteous. And neither is every left, whatever they call left wing, left whatever. Your, your, your righteous symbol is the word of God. That has to be your filter. It should never be anything that circles your life that points people away from the God that you serve. There should never be comments. Nobody in this room, please, in the church on the rise people, I beg you, please don't have negative racial comments on your Facebook page. Well, I'm, I'm, now, mind you, I'm probably the only person on the staff that can stand and say that like that. But I am. For any race, any differences, let's not do that as a body of believers. Why? Because Ephesians 1 5 tells us we're brothers and sisters. We're, in Christ Jesus, we are brothers and sisters. 
adoption as sons. So we've all been adopted into the same family. Predestined means he marked it out beforehand. And you know what we got to do as a body? Those of us, those who are not in Christ yet, they're on the potential adoption list. That's good. That's good. They're, they're potential. They're waiting for the right person to come and say, yes, let me share the gospel with you. Come into my family. So even though they may not be a brother or sister yet, they are potential. And that's how we need to treat them. Your conversation should never contain hate about anybody, about anything. Why? If you're full of God, God is love. Your conduct should always reflect Christ. Why? Because Philippians 127 says, I only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Only. It didn't say sometimes, or if you felt like it, or if they hurt your feelings, or they agree. It says only. Then when you move down to Philippians 4.1, and I'm almost done. It instructs us to stand firm in the Lord. We have to persevere through the process and stand firm in the, pro- in the midst of all of this. We've got to be able to stand. No matter what flags are being raised, no matter what's being burnt, no matter what's being said, no matter what the world and the media is trying to sell you, you've got to know what the Word of God says. And you've got to stand on that and not allow those signaling devices to take you off the truth. You can't allow it to move you. You've got to get planted on the rock of your salvation. You've got to know that you know what God has called you to. And I'm not saying what he's called you to be, because we're still all trying to figure that out. Some of us still know we want to be where we grow up. But we're in the process. But you've got to know who you are. Which is why coming to church and then going home, it, it's just not enough anymore. Because you're going to get opportunities where you're going to have to stand for what you believe. I love when people say, well, Keisha, what do you think about this? I'm like, now you know. Don't ask me nothing you don't want to know what I answer for. Now I'm glad you asked. Well, what about this? And I love when they start pulling out scriptures all out of context. I'm like, bam, I got something for that. Come on. Okay. Now what about this? Let's go back. So when they see, when you're there, if you don't know what's in this, how can you refocus their telescopes to the true image? We gotta become students. We gotta focus. We gotta keep our eyes fixed on Christ. Number two, we gotta remember. Remember that this world is not your home. You don't have to, these rules don't necessarily apply to you as kingdom citizens. I can't do it. I know what people are saying. Just like someone said, well, they asked me, will you marry people? Of course, I'm a pastor. Would you marry a gay couple? Well, did you, uh, uh, okay, let me see. Did you, now, I'm so glad you asked. That's, a, that's my new stage line. I'm so glad you asked. You know what? Sit down. I'm so glad you asked. And I'm not being ugly. I'm not being negative. But by the time they leave for me, even if they don't agree with me, I've been kind and loving enough that I've planted enough word that when they get home at night, they don't even wonder about that thing. And I'm expecting to call back in two days. So we can finish the conversation. Because I got to remember, this that's how the world acts. Do you beat a two-year-old for saying, no, 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 mom, mom? Do you, no, you just talk to them and you deal with them. You train them. You know what? The world, they have no training. They don't know. But you do know. You got to unite. We got to stand united. Not because I agree with your opinion. We don't all have to agree on anything to be kind. We don't have to agree on stuff. Some of the best conversations I ever had, and I don't even see them in here, is me and Pastor Jason. Why? Because we'll sit down and there's race questions he's got. And I got a few. And we sit there without judgment, without whatever. Here's what my thoughts are. What about this? And we talk it through. Does, do I change, does, does my opinion of him change because we have different experiences? No. I respect him. He respects me. A lot of times we come to a new level of understanding. And there's sometimes I still felt like I felt. He still felt like he felt. Love you. Go on to the next conversation. Because I understand the enemy will want us divided and offended. But his experiences are his experiences. Mine are mine. Use them as opportunities to be enlightened. Not pass judgment. We need to to stand for the sake of the gospel. Even if we don't agree. 
regardless of our experiences. We need to trust. Here's what we have to realize. All this stuff that's going on in the world didn't catch God on guard. He's not like, sitting in heaven like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Oh my God, they brought the Confederate flag. They take it to heaven off TV. Oh my God, what am I going to do? No! <laughs> this, is, no this is not a surprise to him. You've got to trust that the God that you serve wrote the end of the story from the very beginning. He wrote the end of it. You've got to trust that. And you've got to walk in that, in faith, and in the confidence that God's got this. No, I don't understand how it's going to come together, but I don't need to. The book says I win. Ah! <laughs> it didn't say what I had to go through to get there. I just know until I'm there in that complete perfection, it ain't over. I'm still in pursuit until that happens. Then we got to persevere. And we got to realize that the prize far exceeds the process. Every process looks different. But you know what? You got to realize that your steps are being ordered by God. And he's got you. Philippians 3.10 says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Maybe you're here today and you're just here because the 4th of July and everybody clicked out yesterday. They invited you so you came. You're just here. Maybe you're here and you don't have that resurrection of power of God on the inside of you. You need to realize it is available to you today through a personal relationship with Jesus. Some of you are here and you got all these flags of distraction going on in your life right now. That's taking your focus off of Christ and it's putting on circumstances. And it may not be the flags out there on the floor, but it could be your bank account. Because it's sending you a signal. Wondering whether or not God's going to provide. It could be your doctor's report that's sending you a signal. you got all these flags that are distracting you right now. Or maybe you're just sitting here today and your life looks like muddy waters. What does that mean? Proverbs 25, 26 says, Like a muddy spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. Like a muddy spring, which was once clean, or a polluted well that was once clean are the righteous who give way to the wicked. Maybe you are a Christian here today and you've been made righteous by Christ, yet you become a muddy spring. You'd allow politics and all this garbage that's going on around you to, to pollute you and you didn't even realize it. Maybe you re all of this is taking your scope out of focus. And it took me today kind of bringing some of that to the light for you to see it. You know, you've probably heard about putting a frog in a kettle of water. And if you heat it up slowly to a boil, the frog just adjusts to the warming water and he doesn't even realize he's boiling to death. This is possible because as you increase the temperature, gradually, the frog initially starts out thinking he's taking a warm bubble bath. He's chilling. This is good. He's chilling. And he doesn't realize as time is progressing that he's turning into a boiler hot tub until it's too late. See, the frog's body adjusts to its surrounding, never noticing that the very thing that is surrounding him is draining the life out of him. It's destroying him. And that's no different in society. The water temperature is increasing slowly and daily around us. And without even realizing, many are becoming acclimated to the environment and to its distractions. They got this broken focus going on. And many are becoming desensitized to what is right and what's wrong, what is good and what's evil, what's life-giving and what's life-destroying. Many are losing sight of their first love. They're moving away from God one degree at a time. And if that is you, and you're here today, God told me to tell you to get out of that pot. Whether you need to turn to God, whether you need to turn back to God, or you just need to lean into God for a spiritual cleansing, whatever the case is, today is your day when you can change that. You, you can get out of that. You don't have to keep spiraling through that. You can literally raise and wave your red flag. You can wave your red flag and say, you know, when you think about a white flag, it's really symbolic of surrendering. You know, on the encounters, we throw the white flag down. You can wave your red flag as a fresh commitment of to who I serve and to where I place my allegiance. As I was um, praying this morning and I had on my bracelet, this wasn't even in my lesson to share, I wear this every day, and it says, I am remnant. I read a book a few months, a few years, I don't know, they run together. But it was talking, the name of it was I am remnant. And it was talking about being the remnant. And when, as I was getting dressed this morning, the Lord took me to Romans 11, 5. And it tells the story of the remnant that was preserved back in Elijah's day. If you look back at that, it, the remnant gave Elijah hope that God would fulfill his promises for their future. 
And if you look up the term remnant, it is simply a remaining fragment. A remaining fragment. So I just happen to believe in Paul's day and in Elijah's day and today, right here, there's a remnant of believers who will stand. I believe there's a remnant of believers who will raise their red flag for Jesus and represent the God of our salvation. I believe there's a remnant here just like it was for Elijah, just like it was for Paul. And I want to ask if you're here today and that's your new commitment, that is your fresh desire to wave a red flag. To, for this to be the mantra, for this to be the God, for this to be the, the image you have in your scope. If that's you, just would you wave your hand? If that's you, if that's your commitment, ladies, mm -hmm. if that's you and you just a fresh commitment to not be distracted by all the smoke screens, to not be distracted by everything that the world is throwing at you, to not be distracted. If that's you, I want you to take one of these. Y'all know my youth pastor, so we always doing something. But I have some of my leaders put together little red flags for you. Why? Because I want you to put it someplace to remind you that your standard, your life is not shaped by media. Your heritage doesn't shape your assignment now. Your birthright doesn't even, because last time I checked, we were all born in a sin. Your birthright doesn't do it. It is not until we receive Jesus Christ and we become new creations that we can stand and declare with boldness and confidence that we are destined for the prize of a high calling that's greater than anything that we could ever hope or imagine. And as they're passing out those flags, I just want you to keep your head up so they don't know who to get them to. But I just want you to take a moment and close your eyes. I'm about to pray. And as before I open up in prayer, I just want you to have a, a moment of honesty. And just ask yourself, what flag has been flying so loudly, so highly, so boldly in your life right now that it's broken the scope, that it's changed the image? Just take a moment with God. What is it that's flying that you've allowed to get in the way of focusing on what Christ paid for you to enjoy? And as they begin to play softly, if you know what that is, you know what? I mean, as soon as I said it, it crept up in your mind. For this last song of worship, I want you to join me at the altar as we pray. And we release that thing. We renounce that thing. And over it, we place the flag of Jesus Christ. We place the flag of what he purchased for us on Calvary. We place the flag before us, reminding us of what God has called us to press toward and to strain toward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now I thank you for every person that's here. And God, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. And I know it wasn't necessarily sweet potatoes and peaches, but God, sometimes we need asparagus and Brussels sprouts. So God, I thank you that even as this word is going forth, that you will just do in us what needs to be done. Help us to be transparent with you. The Bible talks to James about looking into the mirror of the word. God, help us to see us. And help us to see us in you. And anything that's blocking or anything that's hindering or anything that's sabotaging us from seeing you clearly. And being the men and women that you've ordained us to be. Anything that's placing hate or division and strife in our hearts, God. We're asking that you purge and pull it out. God, anything that's trying to occupy space in our life that was designed for you, God. We serve an eviction notice right now. We renounce worldliness. And we stand on your word. We embrace the love that you have for us. And commit, Lord, to share that to others. And God, I just that there's someone here that's never accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And they're saying, I, I, I can't even start running this race because I don't even have the tools. I don't even know where I'm going. I don't even know who I am, God. If they're here, if you're here and you've never made Jesus Lord and Savior, I just want you to toss your hand in the air. Nobody's looking at me. If you never made him Lord and Savior, hallelujah. Today can be your day where you turn to God. You turn back to God where he gives you that spiritual plan. So God, even as we stand here now, you know the needs, you know the hearts, you know where they're located. God, do in us what you desire to do. Right now, we surrender, God. We throw in the white flag, and we surrender. And we say, have your way. 
have your way. We surrender, God. And we raise the banner of love, the banner of sacrifice, the banner that calls us to go and make disciples. But God, first we have to be one. So we thank you for, per for just touching us in a very personal way. And for ministering to us as individuals, God, as you see fit. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. For our last song of worship, if that's you and there's some things and you need to do a little service with God, His presence is here, His power is here, I invite you to come and just do a little one-on-one -on -one with God. Those things that have blocked your view, they can be left right here. Those things that have hindered you, the hardness of heart, bitterness, whatever it is, you can leave it right here at this altar. The altar. Ah.